please have a seat. And we continue with the lectionary. So again, some of you know this, but this year we have decided to follow the lectionary. So interesting to know that lots of other churches around the world will be having this same reading this morning. And we're going to hear from Luke chapter 18, and Justine is going to come forward and read for us. Okay, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. To some who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Thank you. Title this morning, The Seduction of Pride. And I thought that was a pretty cool title, if I'm honest, The Seduction of Pride. And I thought, well done, Mike, you come up with a good title there. I need to go on Google and find out other sermons and be called The Seduction of Pride. Anyway, Lord, we thank you this morning that we aren't like that Pharisee. Can you see the problem with that prayer? Pride. Thank God I'm not as bad as that person. And we end up looking down upon them like the Pharisee was looking down. One problem with pride is that it is so blooming sneaky and it's so hard to spot our own pride. How about you? How's your pride thermometer? I don't struggle with pride when I <laughs> Actually, knowing most of you, you'd be very well aware of some of that. Benjamin Franklin, I thought he was a president. I only learned the other day that he was actually one of the founding fathers in America, said this, there is perhaps no one of our natural passions so hard to subdue as pride. Beat it down, stifle it, mortify it as much as one pleases, it is still alive. Even if I could conceive that I had completely overcome it, I should probably be proud of my humility. As an Enneagram type 2, I am very aware of pride. For those of you who don't know about the Enneagram, it's a kind of like personality tool which some of us have found very helpful. There's nine different personality types and the type 2 is often known as the helper. And part of pride can come in because not all twos and it varies, but often they will struggle with asking for help, try and do it on their own, or they will be natural helpers, which is great, but guess what happens sometimes? Pride can sneak in and we can become proud of how good we are at helping and how clever we are at helping. But what I'm pleased to say that as a mature Enneagram type 2, I no longer struggle with pride. <laughs> it's so sneaky. Church minister, the late Paul Powell, said this, Pride is so subtle that if we aren't careful, we'll be proud of our humility. When this happens, our goodness becomes badness. Our virtues become vices. We can easily become like the Sunday school teacher who, having told the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector, said, Children, let's bow our heads and thank God we are not like that Pharisee. A wonderful reading, really clear in terms of a parable, I think. 
because often it's, what about that's about? But this seems to be really clear. You have a tax collector, those looked down upon by many in the temple, praying from that position of humility and mercy. Maybe actually not seeing quite how much God values and sees the wonder of who he is. But then we have the opposite. We have the Pharisee who actually is very certain and starts praying to God, but actually most of the prayer is about how wonderful he is doing. He's doing the right things. He is giving the tithe, he's fasting in accordance with the law at the time, but actually he's going above and beyond. He is tithing more and he is fasting more than is expected of him. It's all part of his self-righteousness. God declares the tax collector righteous, justified, made right in the eyes of God, right with God. And it's all by grace. Thank God the whole of our faith is all by grace. I want to think a little bit about spiritual, religious pride, because it is so key. It causes so much damage. It's always caused damage. It's always been there. It's always been sneaky, destructive and seductive. And a particular snare to the religious. That's why Proverbs made it very clear. Proverbs 11, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. Proverbs 16, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. There are so many examples of spiritual pride. I guess some of them are coming to mind for you as I mention that. Often happens when somebody thinks it's only them who have worked out God. looking upon others as though they don't quite get God or really don't get God as well as I get God. Or it could be my church is the only church that really understands and listens and hears and is obedient to God. It can come when we think it is only us who understand the Bible. When we see the Bible in a literal way, and guess what, we are the ones who know in a literal way what it means, rather than the, the beauty, the different types of literature, the mystery, the fact we see through the glass dimly. It can be when we do think, I am really, we might not voice it, but we come across like this, I'm the only faithful one really, I'm really, really, really faithful compared to that lot. I was thinking of Elijah when I was thinking about that this morning. And Elijah, who was a great prophet and doing many good things after his mountaintop experience and having seen the obvious power of God, then gets into a bit of a sulk and goes off into the wilderness. And these, these lovely words to God, am I the only faithful one left in Israel? God gently points out, actually there's thousands of you. It is so seductive to think that you are the only one really representing God, that you're a little bit of a prophet. I love God turns into I love God. Self-righteousness. When we speak as though we are speaking for God, fascinating the number of people I have met over the years who are quoting God. And I'm often left with that feeling, actually, no, you're getting God to back up your ideas. Whereas people come up to you in humility and say, I'm wondering about this, and I'm thinking, I wonder if you're hearing from God. Key thing about that is testing. That is part of the beauty and wonder of church. We test that kind of thing in church together. Not the maverick, not the lone person saying, I am hearing from God. So dangerous. When pride gets a grip, we can often be critical of others. It's just there. 
pointing, pointing, pointing. We get very defensive as well. If somebody points out something wrong about us or, or doesn't quite believe that we're hearing from God and that we're a prophet and that we understand the Bible as well as we think we do, or we dare to say, well, actually, maybe that's a little bit different, it can turn into bullying. It's so sneaky that actually a lot of it is about attention seeking, the light shining on the person, whilst claiming to be drawing attention to God. Again, notice how the Pharisee starts off the prayer by speaking to God, but then mainly talks about himself, I, I, I. The proud are the kind of people that Jesus had a lot more to say something about than the sinners, sinners that the proud often look down upon. When we succumb to pride, and we can all succumb to pride, we often want to tell people where they're going wrong, or tell other people where we can see that person going wrong. Over the years, it's been fascinating. Over the years here, the number of people who have contacted me, wanting to meet up for a conversation, who I've never heard of before, writing to me, emailing me, Am I often sensing this wouldn't be a conversation? You literally want to tell me where we are going wrong. I have had, Peter has had loads of healthy conversations with ministers, with others who really disagree with us, but that has all been within relationship or in a relational way where there's mutual listening. That's when humility comes into it. Peter and I have sometimes been asked to offer our thinking and the experience of Worthing Baptist Church to other churches and other ministers. But we'd only ever do so if invited. We wouldn't go around saying, Wah. And I think you know with our preaching, we don't tell you are a bullock. We offer in it together. It's all part of our learning together. We both have a really high view, Peter and I, of preaching, that God can use it as a help to the church, but it is us discerning together what God is saying and wrestling with scripture together. That's part of the beauty of church. Leaving it, this is key, for the Holy Spirit to let the penny drop to bring conviction. I don't like labels, we mentioned that earlier, but I guess I would see myself as what might be called a progressive Christian. I prefer adaptive, the word that Brian McCarran uses, rather than more conservative. But being progressive can also lead to pride. I've noticed it in my heart over the years. How can people really still believe that? And I don't want to become what pastor and author Jeff Lucas calls a Pharisee about the Pharisees, or the frozen chosen, his other phrase he uses. Progressives need to have humility to realise that not everything progressive is progress, and not everything that is conservative is not worth conserving. Ministers need to be really careful. Wonderful theologian in the last century, Karl Barth, said, whenever men, and we would obviously, this was of his day, for some people it's still their day, but we affirm this is men and women, whenever men suppose themselves conscious of the emotion of nearness to God, whenever they speak and write of divine things, whenever sermon making and temple building are thought of as an ultimate human occupation. Whenever men are aware of divine appointment and of being entrusted with a divine mission, sin veritably abounds. Unless the miracle of forgiveness accompanies such activity, no human demeanor is more open to criticism, more doubtful or more dangerous than religious demeanor. No undertaking subjects men to so severe a judgment as the undertaking of religion. 
But again, pride is so hard to spot for any of us, not just ministers, because it's ever so sneaky. Even when, this is how sneaky it is, even when the proud person goes around and says, I'm only a sinner saved by grace, it can turn into that Uriah Heap from Charles Dickens. David Copperfield, Uriah, I'm ever so humble, ever so humble. I gave up smoking when I was about 15. But have you noticed with former smokers, they become very judgmental about people who smoke often. Dirty habit, how could you? Finger pointing. Well, Christians can seem very much like that, wanting to impose grace upon sinners. I cringed the other day, absolutely cringed, when hearing about all the shenanigans going on in Parliament and one of the BBC reporters was standing out front on the grass there and the person with the banner, repent, turn to Jesus, came on and I was like this, oh my word. Then I saw on Facebook so many Christians saying, isn't this wonderful? I respect their difference, but actually my concern is that kind of preaching sends people further away from Christ rather than seemingly attractive. I could be wrong. How else is pride so sneaky? How else is pride so seductive? I rarely quote Jonathan Edwards, the pastor, the theologian of the 18th century. And I don't quote him much because he seems to have a very, very harsh view of God and the wrath of God and a very, very, very low view of humanity, but some good as well, in my humble opinion. But Jonathan Edwards said, the first and worst cause of errors that abound in our day and age is spiritual pride. This is the main door by which the devil comes into the hearts of those who are zealous for the advancement of Christ. Sometimes it's those of us with a passion, a zeal for God, that can slip into being proud. Pride within Christianity, pride within churches, is possibly the ugliest type of pride. Where darkness masquerades as light, evil masquerades as good, and pride in a twisted way masquerading as humility. And again, I think it is so ugly because it puts people off the most beautiful one who we represent, Jesus Christ. It's so sneaky that it can even sneak in with sincere people, those who want to do good, those of us who believe we are being faithful to God. Lots of quotes today because I came across some lovely quotes. The author David Rhodes says the following, Pride is the dandelion of the soul. Its root goes deep. Only a little left behind sprouts again. Its seeds lodge in the tiniest encouraging cracks. And it flourishes in good soil. The danger of pride is that it feeds on goodness. I often bang on about self-awareness. And I think where there's a lack of self-awareness, this can be a massive problem. As with the Pharisee, we can be in the grip of pride, but don't see it for ourselves. Although, I don't know if you agree, it's very obvious to other people when we are being proud and haughty. We come across as unloving, even when we are talking about the love of God. And often, anger. Anger is lurking underneath. If it's called out, if it's noticed, then the proud person says, yes, it's righteous anger. Comparing themselves to Jesus, turning the tables. Oh, it is so sneaky. A wonderful biblical commentator said this about the Pharisee. We are not warmed by the love of God when we are in the presence of this upright and apparently godly man. What we see, perhaps, is a man whose apparent love for God 
is not at the same time a heart of compassion for his fellows. Righteousness for him drives him away from others. It builds no bonds to those with whom he shares life in Palestine. Well might the Pharisee thank God for his advantages. They were real enough, but along with them comes responsibility. If grace does not lead to grace, it turns out not to have been grace at all. So that's all the, ah, what might the antidote to spiritual pride be? Well, learning to laugh at ourselves. I have been really helped in learning to laugh at myself by having three children, I really have. And I'll say something funny, it might be funny, but actually it was really hard for me. I used to be a really fast runner. I took pride in my speed at school. <laughs> when there was a family get together, should we have a race? And I would win, love it. But I remember the day at Spring Harvest in Paz Opton in France, where having been defeated by my two eldest, I took on the youngest, thinking at least I can win once. And I tried my hardest and I fell over because they beat me running. It was really hard. And you've heard about my paddleboarding experience where I kept falling from pride and they didn't. You can either fight it or grow and go with it. They have taught me so much and I've never chosen any of it. The challenge is within ministry. Thank you, Lord, sincerely, thank you that you were with me through them. But it's through being humbled and through tough stuff that I think that has been a learning area for me. Another antidote is keeping perspective. Keeping perspective in life it is worth reminding ourselves that again and again that as human beings we are pretty tiny and our brains compared to God's mind are very small to the infinite God. Paul says in Corinthians, knowledge puffs up. Even our theology, even our understanding of God, our understanding of the Bible can fill us with pride. As I said earlier, we do really see through the glass dimly. We're going to see clearly one day when we see Jesus face to face, but we see very dimly. That's why we need faith. Let's remember that you and I might not have the hotline to God. It is always my understanding of the Bible, not the understanding of the Bible. It aggravates when I see people say things like, the biblical view of marriage. Uh, <laughs> some of the marriages described in the Old Testament, huh? The sin of certainty. Pride is often behind the sin of certainty amongst Christians. Again, Karl Barth says, of all the disciplines, theology is the fairest, the one that moves ahead and heart most fully, the one that comes closest to the human reality, the one that gives the clearest perspective on the truth which every disciple seeks. But of all the disciplines, theology is also the most dangerous, the one in which a man and woman is most likely to end in despair or, and this is almost worse, arrogance. The study of God should lead to deep humility. The healthy side of Judaism, I love this, that when they read scripture together, it's the start of conversation. How good is that? Whereas in much of Christianity, it's the end of the conversation. Scripture and religion is, as Richard Rohr says, the finger pointing to the moon, not the moon itself. Sometimes we get stuck on the finger. Scripture is the cradle in which the baby is held. Sometimes we think the cradle 
is the baby. Again, self-awareness, though so important, is often dismissed by the proud. I don't need self-awareness, just Christ-awareness. Sounds very grand. But the truth is the proud often aren't aware that they're proud. Because self-awareness and humility is a hard, painful journey. Listen to the words of the tax collector. It comes from a place of learning and being humbled and pain. But the treasure is, he knew grace. One final example, because this is really, really key, I think. Seeking the mind of Christ, understanding the Bible as best we can, is to be done in community, as I say. It's sometimes that person with so much certainty within a church community that alienates everybody else and it's pride. Often they will leave that community because that church is not good enough for them. Sometimes for good reason they'll leave, but sometimes it is pride looking down upon but that might happen to the next church. Or many go maverick, and then they really become the prophet. Community discerning together. And dare I say, hopefully without pride, that is part of the growing beauty of this church. Let me draw this together, the seduction of pride. Jesus lived a life without pride when he walked this earth, showing a humble love for people. When he challenged sin, and he did, this was always in a hopeful, restorative way. Always loving. I'm going to close with this reading from 1 Corinthians. Because I think it says it all. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonour others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Amen. I'm going to invite Steph back and we'll stand together for our final song. <laughs>